Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you very much for coming to the World Health Organization headquarters here in Geneva uh, for the update on the situation regarding novel coronavirus. Uh, also, a big welcome to all journalists who are dialing in and hope uh, we will not have technical issues. I, I understand we had some, so hopefully everything will work fine. Uh, also, this is being uh, broadcast on WHO Twitter and Facebook account. As always, we will have a we will have a transcript uh, later in the evening from this briefing and audio file immediately. For journalists uh, listening to us online, please dial 01 on your keypad to be put in a queue to ask questions. Uh, today uh, we have with us uh, Dr. Tedros, WHO Director General, Dr. Mike Ryan, Executive Director for WHO Health Emergencies Program, and Dr. Sylvie Brown, who is the Director for Global Infectious Hazard Preparedness. We also have uh, Dr. Maria Van Kerkhove, who you already know, as well as we have uh, our Director for Strategic Planning and Partnerships, Scott Pandergast. Two of them may be answering some questions. So I'll give the floor immediately to Dr. Tedros for, for his opening remarks. Dr. Tedros. Thank you. So t today's uh, press conference is as what we have already announced that we will have a daily press conference starting from today. So this will be the first one. And we will continue to have a daily briefing unless you're tired of us. Um, so I'd like to start by saying good afternoon and welcome to all media. It's a record actually, more than 100, including those uh, online. And thank you so much for your uh, interest on this very, very uh, important uh, issue during these very difficult times. And let me begin with uh, the latest uh, numbers. As of uh, 6 a.m. Geneva time this morning, there are 24,363 confirmed cases in China and 490 deaths. In the last 24 hours, we had the most cases in a single day since uh, the outbreak started. <laughs> Outside China, there are 191 cases in 24 uh, countries and one death in the Philippines. Of those, 31 cases are in people with no travel history to China, but all are close to contacts of a confirmed case or of someone from Wuhan. So far, 99% of the cases are in China, and 80% of cases in China are from Hubei uh, province. Last night, I said that some high-income countries are well behind in sharing vital case data with WHO. I'm pleased to report that since then, uh, many countries are already uh, reporting, uh, and this is uh, welcome uh, news. As I said last night, the relatively small number of cases out China, outside China gives us a window of opportunity to prevent this outbreak from becoming a broader uh, global crisis. Our greatest concern is about the potential for spreading countries with weaker health systems and who lack the capacity to detect or diagnose the virus. We are only as strong as the weakest link. Those of you listening to the technical briefing yesterday heard the plea from some developing countries for funding. And there are many countries in the same position. What is WHO doing to support those countries could be the question. We continue to support the Chinese government's efforts to address the outbreak at the epicenter, at the source in Wuhan. We must not forget how difficult this is for the people of Wuhan. But doing our best at the epicenter slows the spread of the virus, and that's what we're seeing. We're also continuing to provide scientific leadership. Today, the Strategic and Technical Advisory Group, chaired by 
Dr. David Heyman uh, was, uh, has, has met and given us uh, advice, especially on areas that uh, we don't know. Separately, WHO has released a total of nine million U.S. dollars from our own contingency fund for emergencies. WHO is sending half a million masks, more than 350,000 pairs of gloves, 40,000 respirators, and almost 18,000 isolation gowns from our warehouses in Dubai and Accra to 24 countries. And we will add more countries. We are sending 250,000 tests to more than 70 reference laboratories globally to facilitate faster testing. But we need to do more. This is not enough. That's why today we are launching a strategic preparedness and response plan to support countries to prevent, detect, and diagnose onward transmission. We are requesting 675 million U.S. dollars to fund the plan for the next three months. 60 million of that is to fund WHO's operations. The rest is for the countries that are especially at risk and who need our support. Our message to the international community is invest today or pay more later. Invest today or pay more later. 675 million US dollars is a lot of money, but it's much less than the bill we will face if we do not invest in preparedness now during the window of opportunity that we have. Once again, we cannot defeat this outbreak without solidarity, political solidarity, technical solidarity, and financial solidarity. I would like to thank the Bill and M Melinda Gates Foundation for quickly stepping up to offer 100 million US dollars in support for accelerating response efforts, strengthening preparedness systems in the most vulnerable countries, and to support diagnostics, vaccine and treatment research and development. As you know, we're working very aggressively on developing therapeutics and vaccines. And this pledge from the foundation will help us in speeding up the research on therapeutics and vaccines. Finally, we understand that people are worried and concerned, and rightly so. But this is not a time for fear. This is not a time for panic. It's a time for rational, evidence-based action and investment, while we still have a window of opportunity to bring this outbreak under control. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tedros. Uh, so now I'll give a floor uh, to uh, Dr. Ryan, if uh, you know. So then, uh, then we will go to Dr. Brian, who maybe can tell us a few words uh, uh, about a, a meeting she announced yesterday at a press conference uh, at the UN regarding uh, talks with the travel industry. Dr. Brian, please. Yeah, thanks a lot. So indeed, today we had a second teleconference with uh, a travel and tourism industry. Uh, the aim of those teleconferences is really to um, uh, foster the dialogue between uh, WHO and uh, those uh, companies. Uh, most of them are, uh, I mean, interlocutors are umbrella companies uh, such as the UN uh, um, World Tourism Organization or IATA or ICAO. And, so, um, and also some individual airlines that are attending those calls. So as I said, the aim is to really um, uh, have a good dialogue with them, uh, firstly on the situation, secondly on the risk, uh, how they perceive the risk, uh, but also uh, we can uh, then comment on what is the risk and the evidence we have on the risk and the disease. And we discuss also the measures that are put in place, whether these measures are for their customers 
or the measure for their own employees. So today, the discussion was really to uh, understand uh, what challenges they are facing uh, currently after the announcement of the uh, public health uh, emergency of international concerns uh, and uh, how uh, we can help them uh, to uh, face uh, this uh, new uh, situation. So um, what they express as a concern is the fact that um, uh, the situation uh, in the world uh, uh, is diverse and um, uh, of course uh, the epicenter uh, remain in, in China but some countries have uh, uh, imported cases and therefore they have observed a diversity in the implementation of uh, the IHR recommendations. And so we have discussed uh, these uh, different modalities they have been facing and uh, we are continuing the um, dialogue to see how we can reduce the inconsistencies that are currently seen. And uh, very concretely, it means, for instance, that uh, certain companies, uh, they have to um, make different announcements to their passengers on board depending on where the flight is going. And so for them, it's, it's complicated to have different messages uh, depending on the destination. So uh, we are working with them to see how we can uh, reduce those inconsistencies, but also uh, help them to be aware of the evolving situation so that we can have uh, a better collaborative action uh, in the coming days. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Brian. Uh, just before we go to questions, uh, I hear from uh, some journalists online that the sound may not be the best, so I apologize for that. Uh, you may wish also to follow us on uh, Twitter and uh, WHO account uh, where we have a live, uh, live stream. For journalists online, please type uh, 01 on your keypad and you will be uh, put in the queue for questions. So now we will start here in a room uh, and I see Jamie, John, and then we have a lady there with the three questions from the room. Please, Jamie. Uh, yes. Um, hello, uh, Dr. Tedros, thank you for uh, meeting with us again. Um, I have two questions. Um, the United Kingdom and some other countries, about a half dozen, have recommended that all its nationals leave China. This directly contradicts um, the WHO's current recommendations. Um, is that kind of a response from the UK and other countries proportionate and could it actually make things worse? And then my second question just has to do with a um, comments by John McKenzie, a member of your EC today in the FT, who um, said that China's response to the outbreak in its early stages was, quote, reprehensible and that they were hiding cases uh, before that, uh, thank you, Jamie. Before that, I will just uh, repeat the question for uh, for journalists online because we don't have a mic here. So the question, first question, was about the measures uh, introduced by some countries and advice given by the UK government to these nationals to leave the country, uh, to leave China. Sorry. And the second question was about the comments that have been made by one of the members uh, of the EC committee regarding China response. Uh, so uh, I will uh, see who would like to uh, take this question. I, I can have a stab at the, the, the first question. Yes, uh, certainly, uh, as the DG has said, uh, at this moment in time, uh, we need to have uh, uh, calm, well thought out uh, public health measures that uh, protect uh, individuals' health. And uh, I think each country is making assessments based on their own individual risk assessments to their citizens uh, around this event. Uh, however, certainly um, a, a situation where many individuals are, are potentially uh, leaving uh, the country, um, uh, we don't believe those individuals are necessarily at the highest risk, uh, but it's certainly uh, an unplanned measure like that needs to be uh, accompanied with the necessary screening and the necessary public health measures to ensure that. So the issue here is the balance between the measure to protect citizens and the balance of the public health risk protection to protect other citizens. And each country has to make that balance themselves. 
but we will keep in, we are monitoring all public health measures and we've been doing a systematic review over the last 48 hours of all measures taken by all member states and we will be sharing uh, our assessment of those measures with member states and sharing with other member states exactly what everybody else has been doing and try and bring some cohesion and order to that process uh, in the coming days. Yeah, thank you. And to that I would um, also add that, um, you know, considering China uh, as if the problem is the same in all provinces uh, could be wrong, uh, and it's wrong. Um, for instance, 80% um, I, I have said it from here, cases in China are from Hubei province. So that blanket, um, uh, what do you call it, approach may not help. And that's why Mike is saying let's make it evidence-based. And we encourage all countries to make their decisions based on evidence, not just a blanket uh, coverage. Because even in China, there are provinces with very few cases, like other countries in the neighborhood or, or beyond. So I think that uh, is very important to consider. On the second one, um, First of all, John is not a member of WHO. He's not a staff of WHO. Uh, I think there could be a problem in the newspaper. It says a member of WHO. It's not, so I think it's good if they correct the facts. And the second uh, comment I have is, I cannot say they did, they hide, or they didn't. But if you see <laughs> the f some of the information we have, the number of cases outside China are very small. When we declare fake, they were even smaller. How many? 98 cases. And when we were discussing about calling the emergency committee, they were 68 cases. If something was hidden, then you would expect more cases to be actually exported from China to the rest of the world, if it was hidden. <laughs> because China is the most connected. I know one airline has like 17 or 18 flights a day. And imagine how the world is really interconnected. Even if China hides it, I don't think the cases would be prevented from crossing the borders to other countries. So it really defeats the logic. So that's why I say it's very hard to take that for me. I'm epidemiologist, by the way, public health specialist. And if there was hiding, I would expect more cases, more than 68, especially the first deliberation of the EC itself. Because many cases would have made it to the rest of the world without even us knowing. But again, I say, let's check. Maybe we will have the after action review and to see if there was something hidden or not. We cannot, because I cannot say whether there was something hidden or not. I can only use some logic to really understand the situation, and that's what uh, I, would, I would propose for the time being. And then one advice I have is, for something happened in the past, we will have the after action review. And we have scientists who will really understand, investigate that, and tell us the truth. Now, as global community, please, let's focus on the actions we can take today <coughs> to prevent this outbreak from spreading all over the world. We have 190 countries in 90 cases in our hands in the rest of the world. It's small. But the situation can get worse. Let's use this window of opportunity to really invest in prevention, to invest in control, and prevent this virus from spreading. It's time to act, not to speculate and spread fear, spread panic. That's not the time. 
it's really time to look forward and act. That's what I would, I would advise. And on WHO side, we will do everything to address this outbreak. But I would leave to such kind of perceptions by whoever it is for the after action review because I don't think it helps now. Let's act and act and act. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank Maybe you I very can just add that, uh, that uh, John uh, is a, an eminent scientist uh, for whom we have uh, great respect. Uh, but John has led a career that has been driven by evidence. And, and I think uh, the issue here is evidence, not speculation. And we need, at this point, to avoid speculation that's not driven by evidence in all spheres, be it scientific, political, or otherwise. Thank you very much, Dr. Tadros. Thank you very much, uh, Mike. Lady here, and then John. Please, Please go ahead. repeat again uh, for the journalist online and we apologize again for technical issues the audio file that you will receive immediately after will be of a good quality first question was about the hospitals that are being built in Wuhan for milder cases uh, what's the comment of WHO second question is of international mission to China that has been agreed do we have news on that and third question was to clarify uh, where we are with the, with the treatments and vaccines being developed thank you um. I'll try and answer the, the technical aspects that the DG may wish to supplement. Uh, it's certainly impressive what's been achieved in a very short number of days in, in China. and uh, represents a remarkable effort, not only in, but in logistics and in planning and architecture. And certainly the ability to bring patients, be they moderate or severe, to a site where they can be treated properly, not only helps those patients, but also helps uh, remove those patients uh, who may be infectious uh, from the rest of the, the community. This is a, a major, major uh, undertaking. Um, and uh, <coughs> those <coughs> uh, hospitals now and the, the, the various facilities that have been set up also, remember, uh, will be staffed by, by uh, Chinese doctors, nurses and others who have come from other parts of China to help. So it's also a remarkable act of solidarity within China between the provinces uh, and clearly demonstrates the, the determination uh, of the Chinese health authorities uh, at this present time. So they continue to do everything humanly possible both to put the health of their own population above any other consideration and in doing that offer an opportunity for the rest of us to prepare. Um, the international team we've been engaging very closely with Chinese authorities and we have agreement in principle for the team. We're now working on the final composition of that team. I won't speak to the exact membership of the team as we're still making arrangements for that but I can assure you that this is a multinational team made up of global experts from the north and south, um, from the east and west, who will cover areas from clinical management to virology to vaccine uh, drug development, uh, ec ecologic investigation, uh, animal health, um, epidemiology, public health, and risk communication. Um, the team's objective is to learn 
primarily from Chinese counterparts on their experience in dealing with this event so the world can learn from them. Uh, there is also uh, a huge opportunity for collaboration, for sharing of ideas uh, in order to shape uh, studies in China and studies abroad so we can have a coherent and evidence-based approach. So uh, it would be uh, silly to suggest that a small international team by itself can in any way uh, uh, do more than learn from China uh, and offer whatever brain power it can to our Chinese colleagues who at this stage must be very tired and I think the, this is an act, as the DG said before, not only as an act of science, this is an act of solidarity uh, on behalf of the global community to share the burden with uh, and share ideas with our colleagues uh, in China. Uh, the, uh, the last question was on therapeutics. therapeutics. Yes, there are no uh, proven effective therapeutics uh, for a novel coronavirus. Um, but what we have seen in previous epidemics associated with coronavirus, um, and we see in, in, in this event, that a high standard of care in providing intensive care, especially respiratory support and support to other um, uh, organs is very important. Uh, this epidemic, and if you look at the age and sex distribution, is predominantly causing severe disease and death in older uh, patients, many of whom have underlying conditions. So supporting a patient through the, the, the most severe portion of the infection and ensuring that they don't, and many of the patients who've died have died from multi-organ failure where many organs fail not necessarily directly as a result of the virus infection but as a result of the demand and the shock that the virus causes in the, in the body in general. So many patients of the severe end w will survive if given adequate supportive care. Uh, but that in some cases is very intensive and very demanding uh, on health workers and obviously doing that with full PPE on is a challenge and you've seen that in many of the, of the images. Uh, it is one thing to care for a patient uh, in your normal gear, it's, a, it's an altogether different challenge to do that when you're wearing PPE. Uh, and it is also frightening for the patient themselves because uh, they don't have the normal human contact that we would expect. So uh, this is uh, not a, a normal situation in, 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 in that regard. There are therapeutics that have been used and are being used, uh, like uh, protease inhibitors, like uh, interferons <coughs> and others. Uh, <coughs> and we've been carrying out a systematic review of all of the available therapeutics, and that's been part of the work of the Research and Development Blueprint here at WHO, there are, uh, Maria is here, but there are hundreds of clinicians and others in, uh, in active uh, virtual communication with almost daily teleconferences. And what's been wonderful is to see Chinese clinicians on the line with clinicians who are managing patients all over the world and literally exchanging information of what we're doing, what we did yesterday, what we're doing today, what's working, what's not. But amongst that process we need to bring systematic gathering of evidence and we have created standardized reporting forms for the clinical data so we can centralize all that information to see what is working and what is not. We have also shared clinical trial protocols with all of the countries dealing with cases which allow them to potentially systematically test uh, drugs and next week in Geneva uh, there will be a major meeting which will be both in Geneva and virtual uh, of hundreds of researchers and agencies involved in research to set the priorities for the development of therapeutics, diagnostics and drugs. So this is a global effort from the clinician in the front line today connected to the world and the world connected to each patient through those clinicians and managing that process uh, is a, a huge task in itself but uh, it is a great sign of the solidarity and again remembering that the real heroes in this response are the frontline doctors and nurses who are going to work every day uh, and trying to help and save patients uh, from this virus. Did you? Yeah, I think the, the general had said it all. <coughs> Uh, we're working round the clock. We have an internal core group which is meeting daily basis and also a global coordination meeting on weekly basis. So be it vaccines or support to countries which are vulnerable is checked round the clock. So we will push uh, the same way. One more 
thing I would like to comment on what agreeing on what uh, he said, especially about the expert team. As you may remember, on January 22 and 23, we had a meeting of the emergency committee. This was to decide whether the situation is fake or not. And as you may remember also, January 23, the emergency committee was divided, so the recommendation to me was let's meet in 10 days. So I accepted that recommendation and immediately flew to China to discuss to use that window until the next meeting of the emergency committee. And our discussion was very frank and very candid and there were three outcomes. One on the strategy, <coughs> meaning alignment on the strategy. And we have agreed with the Chinese government to focus on the epicenter, to really take serious measures at the source, protecting the Chinese people and protecting the rest of the world. That is the most important part of the, the travel, which is uh, aligning on the strategy and full commitment from China. The second was sending experts. And the third uh, thing we agreed was on sharing data and sharing information because that's the beginning of solidarity. And all that is uh, taken uh, care of and the uh, team of experts we believe will be uh, leaving uh, very, very soon. But one thing I would like to underline here is the constant engagement of countries is very important. And now we are talking to ministers, and I have spoken to most of them who have reported cases. And the reason being to align on strategies, to align on sharing of information, and to align on other issues like using joint experts to understand the situation. So we will uh, move that way and the uh, use of experts is not just specific to China and this is part of the global coordination that each and every country whether they have reported cases or not uh, should be applied for. And we're increasing the speed we're increasing the scale and we're trying to use the window of opportunity we have to the maximum and that's what we are asking the international community also to use the window of opportunity uh, we have now and many countries have already uh, triggered their uh, operation centers and we will support them in any way uh, possible. Thank you very much. We will take uh, one question that's from John Zagacostas here and then we will go online to some journalists. John, please wait for the mic so I don't have to repeat the question. Yes. Good afternoon. John Zarakostas for France 24 and The Lancet. Uh, Dr. Tedros, you just mentioned that one of the agreements in Beijing was the sharing of the data. Can you shed some light how much of the confirmed Chinese cases you've received the data in Geneva and in regional offices? Yesterday you read the Right Act that many developed countries, less than 40 percent, had provided the data. What is the situation with the Chinese data? What percentage has been received? The reason I'm saying that, there was a classified briefing yesterday in Washington and the most senior senator in the US Senate basically raised concerns about the reliability of the Chinese data. So if you could put that to rest. Thank you. Thanks, John. Yeah, you are correct uh, uh, in terms of the, uh, the number of countries currently of the 24 who we've received comprehensive data from uh, is improving, but it's, uh, it's certainly uh, not complete. And uh, the Director General uh, uh, spoke with the Ministers of Health uh, of all of those countries and actually sent a circular to every Minister of Health in the world specifically reminding them of the, uh, of the responsibilities to share this data uh, on a regular 
if not daily basis. We also, the DG also asks not only for the sharing of the surveillance data, cases, confirmed cases, but for the results of the community studies and other transmission studies that were being carried out so we can collate all of those uh, together. And we've been uh, looking at a, a lot of that data that's been received uh, so far. The, uh, the Chinese authorities continue to share with us daily numbers. They also continue to share with us, as they did at the EC, detailed epidemiologic descriptions and clinical descriptions of the cases, including um, epidemic curves. Uh, we, the, uh, the issues they face in the last uh, week with the growing number of cases is, uh, is sharing detailed and translated uh, uh, individual case forms. You can imagine the challenge for a country X that has 12 cases are very different to a country that has reported 4,000 cases yesterday. So I think we need to uh, leave a little bit of leeway and room here. This is a challenge and we're very careful that we don't want to overtax the system but at the same time get the information we need. We're certainly pleased with the clinical information. We're getting very detailed information on the clinical experience. We're getting very detailed information on the work being done in the lab. Um, as you've seen, they've shared, uh, the country continues to share sequences on, the, on open platforms. So overall, we're pleased. Uh, we would though uh, obviously like to have as up-to-date information as possible, but we say that to all member states. We say that now to every member state that has cases, including China, that we would like daily uh, disaggregated data uh, from them. And this is not so WHO has data. This is not, is not the point. The point is that the world has the evidence it needs to make good decisions in the coming, uh, coming days and weeks. And within the strategic response plan, uh, there is an element of that that's around that global coordination function and you'll see how that's costed out. But you'll also see in the strategic response plan that the vast majority of that investment is actually targeted at countries so they can build their capacity to detect, uh, assess, uh, contain, treat cases and report those cases at the global level. So if you point yourselves to that plan, uh, the, the, the core of that plan is about improving our collective capacity to detect prepare and respond to this event. Thank you very much. Uh, the, the answers were quite long, uh, which is good, uh, but we will have to leave soon, so we have time for two more questions, and I think it's fair that we give one question from, uh, to, to one of the journalists online, so I will call to Nurit from NPR. Nurit, can you hear us? Question, and now I'll give a floor to our friend Chu. Just a second, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, for, uh, I have two questions. Uh, I'm Liu from China's Xinhua News Agency. Uh, first one is specific for um, Dr. Michael Ryan. Um, there are reports about um, uh, U.S. drug companies. Uh, they're sending their anti-HIV drugs to China. Actually, the drugs have arri uh, already arrived in China yesterday. Um, two companies, one is uh, Johnson Johnson, the other one is uh, AppV. Uh, the question is, uh, how come these uh, two anti-HIV um, drugs uh, has anything to do with this uh, coronavirus uh, from the technic spec uh, technical point of view? Uh, and the second question is um, uh, also the reports that um, uh, because of the shortage of not only the PPE, as you call it, uh, but also the uh, diagnostic uh, test and equipment at the epicenter in Hupe, actually in, uh, in Wuhan city. Um, there are death cases. People are dying um, even before they are diagnosed, diagnosed as uh, confirmed cases. They're not even uh, suspects. Um, and because of the a limitation of the uh, the hospitals and the uh, medical resources. They are not admitted to those hospitals. And the question is how the uh, WHO has to say with that. Um, first of all, on the uh, anti-HIV drugs, uh, as I said previously, there are no uh, there are no current therapeutics that are. Uh, uh, thought to be highly effective in the treatment of uh, coronaviruses in general. Um, um, the, 
in many cases when we have a new disease, uh, researchers will look to see what the activity of existing drugs is uh, against uh, a new infectious disease. Uh, in certain circumstances where there is reasonable empirical evidence, uh, countries may use those drugs on a compassionate use basis or an off-label. This is a licensed product which is licensed for use in a certain disease but because the drug is considered to be safe and effective in another disease, in a controlled environment those drugs can be tested against uh, uh, something like coronavirus. But it's extremely important when that is done that, imp that clinical data is collected on the experience of the patient so that that can be used to um, to build the case for or against the use of those drugs. And we've seen in cases too many outbreaks in the past the, the use of different types of interventions and at the end of the outbreak we know less than we knew at the beginning. So it's really important that if such uh, drugs are used, they're used under the authority of the, the national authorities, they're part of uh, either compassionate trials or they're used as part of clinical trials and they're overseen by the highest regulatory and ethical standards and I believe that will be the case in the use of any drugs. I'm looking at Sylvie <coughs> in case she has any supplementary comment to make on that. No, the, uh, I think M Mike is uh, fully right and I think these the drugs uh, uh, have been um, part of uh, other protocols that have been uh, uh, used for uh, MERS virus, which is also uh, a coronavirus, and this is why uh, this is, uh, uh, you have heard about those drugs, but currently uh, none of those have been uh, uh, approved, and it's still, uh, we are still at the research phase, so, and this is something we will discuss next week at this research meeting to uh, see uh, how uh, we can have standardized protocol and how uh, those uh, different antivirals can be used uh, for this particular virus. Regarding the issue of diagnostics in, in China, uh, our understanding is that uh, China, and particularly in Hubei, those labs and those lab technicians is extreme. Uh, so one, c one can expect, and in situations like this, one always sees a backlog. <clears throat> what we're working with <clears throat> the Chinese authorities on is prioritizing that process so that the, the most, uh, most important patients get their diagnosis necessarily. I'm not aware <clears throat> of any particular um, um, individual cases where people have died before diagnosis, I'll be happy to speak with you afterwards, but uh, that certainly isn't the aim. <clears throat> the other thing that sometimes happens, not in this case, is sometimes people come to healthcare very late, and we've seen certain instances of that, and they may be very sick when they arrive. So it's not unusual, it's not, it's not ideal, but it's certainly not unusual to see people diagnosed close to death, especially if they've come late for care. But clearly, there is no question and, um, that this, the system is under some strain uh, and the system is having to react and scale up the response. But again, we must pay respect to the scale up in the lab service that has occurred in particularly in Wuhan and Hubei over the last three to four weeks. Thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, we will have to conclude this press conference as uh, Director General uh, has important meeting to go to. Uh, we apologize to all journalists online for technical issues we had and uh, that we were not be, haven't been able to take their questions. But uh, as Director General said, uh, we will try to have daily briefings of this sort. So please uh, stay with us in coming days. Uh, the audio file will follow uh, shortly as well as transcript. Thank you very much for your attention. So see you tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you.